Okay, hi everyone. I think uh, uh, we're going to start. Uh, so uh, thank you uh, for uh, being here today and uh, welcome to the uh, Philosophy of Psychiatry webinar. Um, so we are uh, very excited to start a new conference series uh, this winter. And uh, we just want to thank uh, the Canada Research Chair on Injustice and Epistemic uh, Agencies and uh, Amandine Catala for her uh, support. So we are very happy um, uh, to welcome our speaker for this session, uh, Robin Bloom. So she's an associate professor uh, with a joint appointment in the Department of Philosophy and uh, uh, Lyman Briggs College at Michigan State University. And uh, her research examines uh, philosophical issues in neuroscience and in medicine with a per particular focus on the relationship between ethical and epistemological questions in this area. She has written extensively on the philosophy of evidence-based practice and on the use of functional uh, neuroimaging in psychiatry. Um, among others, she has published uh, the paper Interpreting Patients' Beliefs about Deep Brain Stimulation for Treatment-Resistant Depression, the Need for Caution and for Context in the journal, uh, American Journal of Bioethics Neuroscience. And she has also published uh, Neurosexism and Neurofeminism in uh, Philosophy Compass. <clears throat> She has also co-edited, uh, among others, the Bloomsbury uh, Companion to Philosophy of Psychiatry, and so she, uh, she is currently uh, co-editor of Neurofeminism, Issues at the Intersection of Feminist Theory and Cognitive Science. Uh, and so today she's going to give a talk entitled uh, Deep Brain Stimulation, Electroconvulsive Therapy, and the Self. So uh, the floor is yours, Robin. Um, thank you very much, and thank you, Emory and Sarah, for the invitation, and thank you to all of you for breaking up your day, assuming you're in the same time zone as me, and, and coming to the talk. I want to start with sort of a standard di disclaimer, I guess, that this is very much a work in progress, and so I'm interested to hear um, you know, what kind of feedback folks have for me. I want to start by giving a little bit of background about the project and uh, some of the sources that have gone into my thinking about this so far. Uh, and then the, the talk is basically structured more or less according to the title. So I'll start by talking a little bit about deep brain stimulation and the uh, literature on changes to the self experienced by people undergoing DBS. Uh, and then switch to a discussion of electroconvulsive therapy and the controversy over memory loss with ECT. And I want to argue that this actually should also be, uh, this conversation should also be expanded to think about ECT's effects on the self. And then bringing these two things together, I want to emphasize that both the, uh, that the discussion of DBS and the discussion of ECT have some really important differences. But ultimately, I think they point to a similar set of concerns and a similar way forward in thinking about how these treatments can affect uh, people's sense of self. So starting with the background, um, this comes out of a longstanding collaboration with Dr. Laura Cabrera. Uh, Laura used to be at MSU with me, and she uh, for the past couple of years has been at Penn State. We started collaborating uh, in 2015 when we both arrived at Michigan State and um, have been looking at uh, ethical issues in treatments for psychiatric conditions. Uh, and this is how we sort of stumbled into the literature on deep brain stimulation in the self. And um, in, in a way that might seem a little ironic, when I talk a bit more about this literature, we have written a couple of papers that contribute directly to that literature. And then more recently, we have been collaborating with two other of my MSU colleagues, Erin McCright, who's a sociologist, and Eric Atchis, who's a psychiatrist. Uh, Laura's the PI on one of the NIH um, neuroethics grants, and we're looking at, um, as the title says, attitudes and ethical concerns about electroceutical therapies for major depression. Um, this project started with a series of interviews, so some qualitative work, trying to understand what uh, psychiatrists who have a range of experience with these therapies um, patients with depression, caregivers for patients with depression, and then members of the public who don't fall into any of those categories, 
think about um, for what we're calling electroceutical therapy. So deep brain stimulation, electroconvulsive therapy, adaptive brain implants or closed loop DBS, and then repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, so I'll be referring to uh, this bigger project to some extent, but also focusing a bit more on the more philosophical aspects of the, uh, um, of the collaboration with Laura. Uh, in terms of electroconvulsive therapy, uh, we have done some work in the empirical project, but I've drawn really heavily on these three sources. So two books on the history of ECT uh, shock therapy by Shorter and Healy, which tends to be a very positive pro-ECT um, approach. Uh, and then uh, Jonathan Sadowski's more recent book, which I think has a, a more um, ambivalent uh, approach and Laura Hirschbein, who is a um, psychiatrist and historian down the street from me at the University of Michigan. Um, and she is directly addressing issues related to the self as well. So again, a lot of this started with my interest in deep brain stimulation and the reports of changes to the self in patients undergoing DBS. So just as a bit of background, deep brain stimulation involves delivering an electrical current to a particular area of the brain, which depends on uh, both the condition being treated and the treatment protocol. Um, the uh, stimulator is powered by a battery that's implanted under the skin of the chest. So it's a similar setup to a pacemaker. And for reasons that I'll get back to later, um, I think it might be important that DBS is often described as being like a pacemaker for the brain. Uh, DBS dates back several decades now um, and has been in common use in the United States for at least 20 years. It is still primarily used for movement disorders. So initially it was um, approved for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. Uh, it's now used for dystonia and essential tremor. In terms of psychiatric conditions, the most commonly treated with DBS is obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, it, in Europe, this uh, has actually been an approved therapy. And in the US, it's used uh, under what uh, the FDA calls a humanitarian exemption, um, showing that there is not the standard amount of evidence available, but given the um, need for the treatment and the severity of the disorder and the people who are being treated, um, the, it, the use of DBS for OCT has been permitted. And there's currently clinical trials um, for the use of DBS in a variety of other psychiatric conditions, including depression, anorexia, opioid addiction, alcohol addiction, Alzheimer's disease, um, the list goes on. I think most of the additional studies have been on depression and honestly, the evidence has been pretty equivocal. Um, that's not something I'm going to focus on here, but that maybe will come up a little bit in the discussion. And not long after DBS was approved uh, for Parkinson's disease, this paper by a German group, and there's a companion paper by the same authors, just in a different order, um, reported that patients who underwent deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease tended to have a difficult time adjusting. And they described a variety of experiences um, including things that were interpreted as being self-related. So people would say, I don't feel like I know who I am anymore. I'm you know, having a hard time adjusting to work or um, my relationship with my family has changed. And then there was a small number of people who reported things like feeling like they were a robot or under remote control because of the electrodes in their brains. Um, and this paper and the other paper by this group really are kind of the, um, they're not actually the first reports uh, of this, there were one or two before this, but these were the things that were taken up and discussed quite a bit in the neuroethics literature. The first philosophical paper, to my knowledge, uh, was published in 2010 by Maria Schechtman. Schechtman refers to the two papers that I was just talking about, but also to some media reports of uh, patients undergoing experimental DBS for depression. And what was happening is that for some of these patients during the surgery itself, because patients are awake for this surgery, 
um, they felt that when the um, stimulation was turned on, their mood suddenly changed completely. So they had been severely depressed, their depression had not been responding to um, standard therapies. And uh, as soon as these um, the electrode stimulation started, they reported feeling happy and they were joking around with the um, medical staff in, in the surgery with them. And this was a real uh, shock for people, both for the individuals themselves and for the people who were watching them. Uh, and Sheffman wrote about this saying that maybe the best way to understand why this is so disconcerting, uh, and this is building on her work on the self as um, a narrative self, is that DBS suddenly broke off a narrative of a person with severe depression and abruptly began a new narrative of a happy person. And she suggests that this could actually be experienced as um, a threat to the individual's identity because of this extreme discontinuity. And over the next decade or so, a number of philosophical and neuroethical papers were published that picked up on Schechtman's arguments. And a lot of them had to do with um, trying to characterize the exact nature of the threat or the problem posed by DBS for the self. So um, people have argued that it's really not so much a matter of identity, but of autonomy or of authenticity, or Kramer actually talks about perceived authenticity or felt authenticity. Um, and then there's been a lot of work, especially more recently on DBS and agency. And this became kind of a cottage industry for neuroethicists. There was a lot of back and forth argument and so much so that in 2001, Frédéric Gilbert and his colleagues published a paper pushing back against this discussion. And they lumped all of these self-related characteristics under the kind of clunky but useful acronym, uh, acronym P-I-A-A-A-S for personality, identity, autonomy, authenticity, agency, and or self. And right around the time their paper appeared, Laura and I published our first paper as well, which also pushed back against some of this discussion. And in some ways, the two papers are coming from a very different position, a very similar perspective, but our um, prescriptions for dealing with it are very different. So Gilbert and his colleagues argued that changes to self with DBS are what they call an established narrative in neuroethics. Uh, and they say that the published literature that actually empirically examines the experiences of people with DBS doesn't support this established narrative, that there are relatively few reports of self-related changes. They point out that all of these self-related concepts are complex and they're difficult to measure. So in response to these two problems that they perceive, they call for large RCTs that are intended to identify the incidence of these self-related changes, and also the development of objective quantitative scales to measure the effects. And Laura and I agree that there is an established narrative in neuroethics and that these concepts are complex and difficult to measure. But we point out that the way that the um, philosophical neuroethical literature has treated this established narrative is first of all, to view all of these changes as being direct results of the stimulation. So if you think back to the um, media reports that Schechtman talks about, it's very clear that the stimulation is causing these changes. The, the mood changes begin immediately. They stop when the stimulation is turned off. Um, and then we also argue that these extreme cases serve as a paradigm for other self-related changes. So people who are talking about more subtle changes or more complex changes um, are assuming that these are essentially uh, qualitatively the same as the extreme changes. They're just um, quantitatively a little less severe. So what we argue is not so much that we want more objective and quantitative measurements to understand the incidents, but that we should be focusing on qualitative studies in order to understand what exactly it is that patients are experiencing when they uh, undergo DBS. Uh, and in this neuroethics paper, we review uh, the qualitative 
the qualitative literature at the time and, and draw out some conclusions from that that I'll refer to later. And in fact, if you go back to the two original sources that I talked about um, in the Schuttbach et al. paper, they explicitly say, sure, some of these changes may be the direct result of stimulation of the brain with the DBS electrodes, but most of them are probably not that. Most of them are probably uh, more complex um, set of experiences influenced by the patient's clinical condition, whether or not they respond to the therapy, to um, changes in their life and their lifestyle, if uh, DBS does actually improve their symptoms. So are they able to return to work or to do things that they couldn't do before? Uh, and then their understanding of who they are uh, being affected by a combination of the, um, the uh, condition, so in this case, Parkinson's disease, uh, the therapy and their relationships with their family and, uh, and friends. Uh, and Schechtman as well distinguishes between these extreme cases that she talks about and then the other broader range of cases reported by Schechtman and Agid and colleagues. And she says those things are not really plausibly understood as the same kind of threat to personal identity because they're not so abrupt and discontinuous. Uh, so again, Laura and I have um, been focusing on this literature on DBS and the self, and we published these two papers related to this. But as we started working on the um, NIH project, we started to think more about um, how similar or different people's experiences might be undergoing treatment with other electroceuticals. Um, and even though our study is not designed to interview patients with these treatments or who've undergone these treatments necessarily, uh, we did talk to patients who have undergone ECT and RTMS and psychiatrists who have prescribed these for patients. So we're getting a little bit of that already. Um, but, you know, being the philosopher in the group, I started thinking, well, you know, how similar are these um, experiences and what can we bring to understanding DBS from discussions of these other uh, health conditions. Uh, so this made me start to think more about electroconvulsive therapy in particular because it is the longest standing uh, of the electroceutical therapies that we're looking at. It's also very controversial um, and has been associated for decades with, in some cases, very severe loss of memory, and in particular, largely autobiographical memory. Uh, so what I want to do next is just briefly give an overview of the controversy there, and then I'll argue that this actually is most plausibly understood as being similar in that the memory loss discussion uh, is really a discussion about the effects of ECT on the self. Uh, so I stole this um, free use uh, picture from Wikipedia. Uh, basically, electroconvulsive therapy uh, also uses electricity to treat depression. Uh, it involves placing electrodes on the scalp and passing an electrical current through the brain. Um, these days, in at least uh, wealthier countries, uh, this is always done with um, the use of a muscle relaxant to prevent uh, overt seizures and uh, potential damage from seizure activity, from muscular seizure activity, uh, and with an anesthetic so patients are not conscious for this. Uh, electroconvulsive therapy goes back to the late 1930s. It was developed in Italy, and at the time it was seen as a shock therapy, um, and in particular as an alternative to the therapies that were in current use, so insulin shock and chemical shock. Uh, it was considered to be much more humane because patients had a much harder time with insulin shock and chemical shock than the early ECT um, experiences. Uh, the idea of shock therapy is based on the, um, the theory that a biological uh, intervention could more or less reset the brain and shock somebody out of uh, 
a state of mental illness. So at the time they were, um, initially it was um, largely used to treat schizophrenia, but over time it shifted more to mood disorders. Uh, ECT was taken up fairly quickly by the late 1940s. It was in use throughout Europe and throughout the US. Um, initially, it was what they call now unmodified ECT, so without an anesthetic or um, muscle relaxant. But by the 1950s, again, in wealthier countries, modified ECT was standard of care. There was a decrease of use in ECT during the 1960s and 70s, and then starting again in the 1980s, it became used more frequently again. But understanding the effects of ECT is a moving target. This is both true for um, the clinical effects, the wanted outcomes, such as the improvement in depression, and also um, for the effects specifically on memory. So there have been changes in protocols and disagreement about the best protocol, including where to place the electrode, uh, the shape and duration of the stimulus, the number of treatments that are required and how far apart they should be spaced. Um, there've been also changes over the decades in who gets CCT. So for a while it was done uh, with only inpatients. So people who were um, in a psychiatric facility, uh, then it was done on an outpatient basis. Now it's done on an outpatient basis, but rather than in uh, the office of a psychiatrist who has an ECT device, it's done in a hospital so that um, the anesthesia can be monitored. Um, and there have also been changes, as I alluded to earlier, in the diagnosis for which ECT is used. And there's also been a lot of disagreement about the theory um, underlying the use of ECT. So um, initially, it was considered to be the, um, as I, I mentioned, a shock therapy. Uh, later on, there was more interest in the specifically electrical aspect of it, um, the seizure or the convulsion. Uh, so there have been studies of sham ECT to see uh, whether you know, that is also uh, effective. Um, and in related to the sham ECT, there have been psychoanalytic explanations. So uh, famously, Sylvia Plath writes in the Bell Jar about her um, her proxy, Esther Greenwood's experience with ECT and the first uh, set of treatments that she gets, which are extremely difficult and painful for her. And she says something like, I wondered what I had done to have been so punished. Um, and uh, so she uh, you know, is very aware of the psychoanalytic explanations of the time. And even now the neural mechanism of ECT is unknown, which is actually also true for DBS. Uh, and there are people who have argued that ECT really functions only by a placebo effect. And that's something maybe we can return to later as well. Um, and in terms of controversy, that's probably the thing that has been the most consistent. Uh, uh, over the decades with regard to ECT. Uh, so historically, ECT was used or abused as a method for controlling or for punishing people in psychiatric institutions. Um, many of you are probably already thinking about one flew over the cuckoo's nest. So this is a very common association that people have. Um, there are controversies over whether it's effective. There are some very strong pro-ECT folks and some very strong anti-ECT folks. And the um, evidence for effectiveness, I guess, is ambiguous enough that you can conceivably mount a good argument on either side, that it works, that it doesn't work. Uh, there's also questions about informed consent uh, and lingering worries because of the history of abuse about the voluntariness of ECT, uh, though I want to point out that in our survey, which followed on the interviews I was talking about earlier, um, none of the groups that we surveyed consider the potential for involuntary treatment to be a top ethical concern. Um, I don't know why exactly, but I, I found that very interesting. Uh, and then public perceptions of ECT are still pretty negative. People think of it as being outdated. Uh, we have people describing it as barbaric or scary. Uh, I've had several people when I've talked to them about this research project look at me in shock and say, they still do that? Um, yes, they do. 
And there's a lot of stigma uh, associated with ECT, which interestingly does not seem to carry over too much to deep brain stimulation. And that's something that I think it would be really important to, to know more about. Uh, in September of 2021, the New York Times published this article. Uh, I, I, if I remember correctly, that study was a chart review looking at people with severe depression uh, who received ECT and who didn't. And the evidence did suggest, as the headline says, that ECT can be a good treatment option for serious depression. Um, and there are a number of comments about the study on or this article online. And just skimming through them, you can see all of the opinions that I, I mentioned. You know, people have, will talk about their own experience or their family members' experience and be very pro ECT or very anti ECT. Uh, they'll make comments about the portrayal in the media um, when flew over the cuckoo's nest, sometimes the bell jar. Uh, there are lots of other depictions in the media that are large, or in movies that are largely very negative. So all of this is still very much a live controversy. And in particular, there are a lot of debates about the nature and extent and even the existence of memory loss in people who've been treated with ECT. Uh, so quoting from the Hirschbein article that I um, had the screenshot of earlier, she says, ultimately, the pro-ECT argument is that there are very serious side effects, or is that very serious side effects are rare, mostly in the past with older forms of ECT, or are the product of hysterical former patients' imaginations. The anti-ECT groups insist that profound memory effects are the norm rather than the exception, and they say doctors are lying about these side effects when they claim that ECT is harmless. Similarly, Sadowski says that permanent long-term retrograde memory loss, the loss of already acquired memories, is the most serious possible side effect of modified ECT, but there's controversy about how common it is. And Shorter and Healy, who, as I mentioned earlier, are tend to be very pro-ECT, acknowledge that disturbances of memory are a real issue, but they say it's not an insurmountable one. Uh, and then they also point out that statistics on memory loss have proven to be something of a quagmire because they're so subjective. And in fact, there's a ton of research on ECT and memory loss that dates back to the very early days of ECT. Um, in the 1940s and the early 1950s, they were focused mostly on people's experiences immediately post-ECT, so they would experience confusion or disorientation, and given these psychoanalytic um, explanations for ECT's effectiveness at the time, there was speculation that this was actually part of the um, therapeutic effect. A uh, textbook in 1946 claimed that the occurrence of permanent memory loss with ECD had been disproven, but it wasn't until the 1950s that the first controlled trials examining memory loss in ECT were, were done. These were um, comparing uh, patients with, I believe it was depression, there may have been other um, diagnose, people with other diagnoses as well, uh, looking at people with and without depression and seeing the um, evidence for memory loss in each of the groups. And then during the 1960s to 1980s, there were studies that were looking at the effect on memory loss of different electrode placement. So again, there's been a lot of research on this. But there's still a lot of um, open questions. So the kind of memory loss, so Sadowski emphasizes retrograde memory loss. Um, and there is also uh, fairly good evidence that people experience amnesia for the time immediately around ECT, but that tends to be temporary and to fade really quickly. Uh, there's also a question about the time span of lost memories. Again, are they, uh, memories fairly uh, from fairly recently before the ECT treatment, or can they go back further? Is the memory loss temporary or permanent? Um, and if you read what people say, quite often people um, forget autobiographical events. Um, they also point to um, forgetting public events, so big news stories at the time that they lose all memory of, and then a variety of other memories. And 
uh, as Shorter and Healy point out, it's remarkably difficult to measure this because it's not clear what kind of evidence is going to do a nice job of establishing what the memory loss is and how common it is. Um, so you know, the loss of memory should be linked to a standardized ECT protocol. Um, so that, or the study of the loss of memory should be linked to a standardized ECT protocol so that we can see whether um, everything else being equal, memory loss is common or uncommon. Um, there's a lot of uh, question about how best to measure memory loss. Uh, you often see things about how patient narratives or patients' reports are subjective and what they really need are objective ways of measuring memory loss. So one of the um, uh, scales that measures autobiographical memory asks people to uh, choose a few life events to talk about before ECT, and then they're asked about the recollection of those um, memories after ECT to see whether their uh, account of those uh, events is still the same. But that seems pretty arbitrary because, of course, there's no way, assuming that this kind of memory loss is real, to predict in advance which memories are going to be affected. So there's kind of an odd sampling error in that. And then there's the question of whether people are actually trying to explain memory loss or to explain it away. Uh, and related to this, there has been a strong and disconcerting tendency in the literature for people who tend to be pro-ECT to seem to be blaming patients, um, not for deliberately losing their memories, but um, you know, attributing the memory loss to the patient themselves rather than to the treatment. So as early as the 1940s, uh, there was a suggestion that patients who were highly neurotic were not good candidates because they're prone to seeing a temporary memory impairment as a permanent and devastating loss. Um, Shorter and Healy also uh, quote a psychiatrist who was a very um, influential ECT researcher saying, you don't give ECT to the character disordered, they'll end up with lifelong loss of memory and headaches that won't go away. And this paper is one of the early and very frequently cited uh, discussions of ECT and memory loss. And uh, I think the title pretty much says it all. It's patients who complain that are the issue. It's not so much what the patients are complaining about, it's the patients being complainers. And I think that that is a really interesting mixed message considering that the study actually does conclude that yes, there is impaired cognitive functioning, including memory loss in people who um, are complaining about their response to ECT. Uh, in his book, Sadowski has a section called Why Memory? And I think that that's a really important question and one that has not always been addressed. Uh, Shorter and Healy emphasize that memory losses emerged as a concern 30 years after ECT had been introduced into medicine. So that would be the early 1970s if we uh, date ECT's emergence back to the late 1930s, early 1940s. Uh, they say it became one of the central battle battlegrounds in psychiatry and an important question is for us to consider why this is the case. And so they give a bunch of examples from the 1970s of discussions of ECT and memory. But in fact, in the earlier slide, I showed that there have been reports of memory loss related to ECT for as long as there's been ECT. So it's not so much that they only emerged as a concern in the 1970s, it's the centrality of the focus and the um, vehemence of the disagreement. I think that matters. And Sadowski talks about the early narratives of ECT. So these would be patient narratives. Um, which he describes as being very much influenced by the anti-psychiatry trends popular in the sort of late 60s, 1970s. And then from about 1980, he says that uh, these memoirs started to acknowledge that ECT had been very, object uh, very effective for the writer. So they have a vivid gratitude for symptom relief. But at the same time, they do say they experience memory loss. It can be quite severe. It can be quite pervasive. And they view this as a real loss uh, for, th for them, uh, a real downside to the treatment. 
And what I want to suggest is that the focus on memory has very much been um, shaped by questions of whether uh, it's real or what kind it is or how often it is. So uh, a little bit similar to the sorts of things that Gilbert et al. say that we should be looking at with deep brain stimulation. Uh, and then if we try to refocus this to think about the self more broadly, uh, we get a different picture of what is going on. I pulled this quote from Ellen Wolf, uh, an ECT patient or user um, who draws a link between the self and the past. And I think that this is kind of emblematic of what's really going on when people worry about uh, memory loss with ECT. So again, Sadowski says that starting in around the 1980s, uh, there's a shift and that he says these earlier uh, pre-1980 memoirs were very much influenced by the anti-psychiatry movement. Um, I think that's a really interesting hypothesis. I would be uh, interested to see him write more about that. But for my purposes, the thing that's really interesting is that he talks about these earlier memoirs as explicitly talking about a loss of self. Uh, so he quotes from a number of them. He does a, a really nice overview of um, a bunch of these memoirs that are available. Uh, so Marion Milner said that she had no inner world after ECT. Marilyn Rice, who wrote one of the most um, uh, well-known memoirs, says, now I know how Eve must have felt created full grown without any history after ECT. And Robert Piercig, the author of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, explicitly says that he was a different person before versus after ECT. And this comes through, I, I read the book, it was a long time ago, but uh, Sadowski talks about how this comes through very clearly in the way that he writes uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Uh, more recently, uh, there have been some studies of uh, the experiences of people who have undergone ECT. Uh, and this article came out in 2021. Uh, the authors did a literature review for qualitative research on ECT and uh, interviews with patients and did what they call a qualitative meta-synthesis, I guess, as opposed to a meta-analysis. Um, I'm not terribly familiar with these methods. Um, and so I went through that article and I looked up all of the papers where they said that people uh, explicitly reported differences to the self. And so these quotes are from the original papers that were included in that review. Uh, so one paper by Johnstone and all said, uh, one of their participants said, I felt as though I had become a completely different person. You feel like you've got to adapt to this new person that you are. A uh, paper by Diana Rose and colleagues, one of their participants said that with the, every shock treatment, they felt more of themselves slipping away. Um, and then uh, this third quote uh, links explicitly memory related things to um, the self. Uh, I really relate to this person because they're uh, a reader and they say that they find that they can't remember books after undergoing ECT, that they've always considered part of them. But on the flip side, there are people who say that ECT returned them to who they used to be. They feel like their old self again. And I think because there are such big concerns about memory in the self, it's important to remember that for some people, these self-related changes are positive. And we also see this in the um, literature on DBS. So Seneca Dahan and colleagues have looked at people uh, who've undergone uh, DBS for obsessive compulsive disorder and a fair number of them do talk about feeling like their old self. So again, I just think that's an important thing to keep in mind. And in addition to the uh, people undergoing ECT themselves, family members also notice these changes. They see the person as um, in some really important ways different after ECT. Uh, so one 2009 paper by Smith and colleagues interviewed family members. Uh, a daughter of a patient referred to her mother's total personality change after ECT. 
Um, a father talks about this uh, in terms of his daughter. She was once a vibrant and energetic person. I've seen this decline after ECT and I'm concerned. So uh, picking up on some of the discussion in the neuroethics literature about the relational nature of the self, um, this is not just individuals understanding of their own identities, but also the way that their um, close friends and, and family members are both reacting to them and potentially influencing the perceptions of the, the patients themselves. And uh, Orr and O'Connor in a 2005 paper, I think summarized the main thing that we need to think about when we talk about memory loss and ECT and the self and memory loss in people who undergo ECT. They say that you can't understand the experience of ECT in isolation. Rather, the stories of these patients highlighted the importance of, understand, of interpreting the ECT experience within a broad context that included the larger depression experience, the dynamic of helping relationships, and the discourse available to them for sense-making. So if we go back to this question, why memory? There are a few things that I think are really clear. First, patients experience memory loss. Um, there's no reason for them to lie about it. It's very clear that people have these experiences and are very distressed by them in some cases. I think it's also clear that negative public perceptions about ECT shape the expectations that patients have going into the treatment. And I think if we ask the why memory question in the context of Sadowski's discussion of the shift in the early 1980s to memory loss as an important topic, um, and I can't back this up, this is a really wild speculation at this point, um, I think that Part of this is probably because around the 1980s, there was a lot of public discussion about memory in general. So the historian Jonathan Ballinger has written a lot about the uh, increase in public discussion and awareness around Alzheimer's disease and dementia during this time and the way that Alzheimer's disease was framed and is still largely framed as a loss of the self. This was also around the time that the memory wars were heating up. So uh, debates about whether false memory syndrome, syndrome occurred, um, worries about uh, uh, the um, experiences of people who had undergone traumatic uh, experiences and how those things are remembered. Uh, PTSD in general was also becoming uh, discussed and the, the nature of traumatic memories themselves. Uh, and then a shift um, among memory researchers uh, as they began to recognize that a recall model of memory is not accurate. We don't have uh, fully fledged memories stored in our brains, but rather we reconstruct them uh, in response to um, cues uh, or other memories. So I think largely the answer to the question why memory comes from um, these issues just as much as it comes from ECT so that the discussion of memory of, of ECT and the self largely was framed in terms of memory. Um, and in fact, the uh, metasynthesis that I mentioned, they actually, in, in the examples that they pulled out of self-related changes with ECT, are largely talking about memory changes. So I think it would be really interesting to go back and try to find how much those discussions were shaped by the expectation of researchers that memory loss was the clear issue. So I wanna conclude briefly by just talking about what the implications might be for thinking, or if we think about the DBS and the self and the ECT and memory and the self cases uh, in conjunction with each other. And it's clear that there are some important differences between the two cases. So the context of the disagreement, the uh, DBS discussion is largely taking place in the academic literature. Uh, it is uh, disagreement among people with a very specific set of uh, ethical interests, um, whereas the ECT disagreement uh, occurred in the public sphere, uh, involved uh, clinicians and patients and thought leaders in psychiatry. Um, so it's a much bigger and broader discussion. Uh, 
at least at first glance, there's a big difference in the nature of the effects. So DBS is related to the self and potentially autonomy and agency and identity, and ECT is focused on memory. There are also questions about frequency. Uh, I think even the uh, people who are most immersed in the DBS literature do acknowledge that the serious side effects seem to be quite rare, whereas that's an open question with uh, ECT. We can't get a good handle on how frequently they are. And then I think, and I will probably park this for now, but we can talk about it in the discussion. I think that it's really important that the perceptions of the intervention among patients and among the public are very different as well. So what I want to talk about just in conclusion is that I've tried to argue that the nature of the effects of the treatment are actually not as different. Um, and that if we think about the effects more broadly, it's not so much that the frequency of serious side effects uh, is the only issue, but the broader question about how people who use these treatments understand the treatment's effect on themselves. Um, so I, I think in some ways, you know, Laura and I are maybe a little bit guilty of contributing to the uh, bubble, as Gilbert et al. put it, uh, around DBS and the self. But ultimately what we're trying to argue for is an approach to understanding these changes that are much more closely embedded in patients' lives and that try to understand a broader spectrum of issues. Uh, so going back to the why memory question, um, this quote that I've already read from Orr and O'Connor, they're arguing for ECT largely what we're arguing for DBS, that we have to understand these changes in context and the effects of the experience of the disorder, the effects of the family and other relationships that people have. And then we've also emphasized the, the discourse available to them for sense-making. Um, Knight et al. in a paper talk about factors that shape people's experience of ECT, uh, and they point to their perceptions of their control over the, um, the therapy, how comfortable they are with it, how they view their relationships with healthcare providers, and these contribute to the positive or the negative experiences of, the, of, of ECT. So in conclusion, what I want to say is that context really matters that patient experiences are shaped by a number of different factors, including whether or not they experience the clinical improvement that they hope for, other side effects related to the treatment, the experience of the treatment on their daily life, which is tied very closely to their clinical improvement, um, to their family and friends and the relationships that they have and how supportive they are. And then echoing back to the um, discourses available for sense-making quote from the previous slide, the narratives that are available to them to make sense of their experience of the disorder and of the treatment. And I think that if we can get a better understanding of these experiences for people, it can help us to develop better narratives about them with patients who can then use them. Uh, and that is all I have. Thank you.